My name is Johan Farkas. I'm a PhD student in Media and Communication Studies at Malmö University in Sweden. And I'm also the author of the book Post-Truth, Fake News and Democracy, Mapping the Politics of Falsehood, which I've written with my colleague Yannick Skov. Today, I would like to present a few, few uh, reflections from my research. And I would also like to pose the following question to you. How do you think we could combat political manipulation and misinformation while making our societies more democratic in the process? I will return to this question in the end. But with that, let's begin by taking a critical look at one of the dominant narratives of our time, namely that we live in a post-truth era. According to numerous scholars, journalists and policymakers, democracy is in a crisis caused primarily by fake news and related phenomena. Rational and factual evidence has been cast aside as political mobs roam social media using new platforms as weapons in a battle against truth-based politics. At the core of this narrative lies a very particular mythos intended to capture not only the current state of democracy, but also the potential ways of solving and overcoming this crisis of truth. Numerous voices have proclaimed that fake news is comparable to a dangerous, infectious disease or even a plague proliferating with alarming speed from body to body through interpersonal contact. This trend was already prominent before COVID-19, but exploded in its wake. These medical analogies for fake news are not mere metaphors or representations. They constitute the rhetorical backbone of a dominant democratic imaginary, guiding the way in which we currently talk about the future of democracy. In my research, I try not only to pull apart the inner dynamics of this imaginary, but also to suggest that the cure it ordains is in many ways a poison. Indeed, the post-truth imaginary often turns out to be deeply anti-democratic in scope, focused on limiting free speech, increasing corporate surveillance, and establishing more centralized forms of governance, rather than restoring genuinely political institutions, popular participation, and the voice of the democratic people. To give some examples, against the backdrop of COVID-19, a host of countries imposed free speech restrictions in the name of stopping fake news and related phenomena. According to Humans, Human Rights Watch, at least 83 governments implemented emergency measures to restrict free speech and peaceful protests. This included new laws and decrees criminalizing fake news about government actions in diverse countries from Hungary to Thailand or Ethiopia to Bolivia. These developments came concurrently with the World Health Organization urging governments to fight the so-called infodemic and researchers recommending to criminally prosecute people for spreading the misinformation virus. As such, these solutions came as logical extensions of prevalent ideas about fake news being a disease that needs to be eradicated. Already before COVID-19, free speech restrictions had become a prominent state solution to fake news across the globe. On all inhabited continents, we find laws criminalizing the creation or spreading of fake news, as well as new forms of corporate and state surveillance of public debate. As can be seen from these many legal measures, the fake news debate has led to drastic solutions, not only to guard democracy against supposed enemies of disinformation, but perhaps also to reform the very structures of democracy itself. The fundamental problem, of course, with these solutions is not only that they one-sidedly equate democracy with truth and fake news to a virus, but also that they fail to capture the history of liberal democracies. As human rights groups and free speech advocates have pointed out time and again, banning fake news will not save democracy but can easily make a society less democratic by silencing political opposition and critical voices. This is especially concerning 
considering the fact that fake news is not a clear term. As we all know, it has become deeply politicized and can easily be used by political leaders to instill their own definition. So building on critical scholarship, I want to suggest that the current democratic crisis is neither sudden nor linked to issues of factuality or fake news alone. More fundamentally, what is at stake is a crisis of democracy caused by an increasingly pervasive dismantlement of proper democratic institutions and popular sovereignty. Developments such as declining voter participation or the election of populist leaders cannot simply be explained by irrationality and misinformation, but must be taken seriously as demands for breaking with the status quo in times of growing inequality, increasing concentration of legislative power in many countries, and profound economic instability. Lamenting apathy or populism as simply the result of a post-truth era risks not only neglecting the democratic tradition, but also entrenching the very crisis it is trying to solve. To protect democracy, anti-democratic measures are often being prescribed at the moment. If we want to strengthen democracy, I strongly believe that we need to strengthen the democratic tradition. This could involve strengthening egalitarian access to education, journalism and political decision making, limiting corporate influence in politics and dismantling the current monopolistic and surveillance based state of digital media environments. To engage with such structural reforms, however, would first require that we abandon the simplistic narrative that continue to dominate and limit our understanding of the past present and future of democracy as a form of cohabitation. So with that, I would like to end by returning to the question I posed at the beginning. How do you think we could combat political manipulation and misinformation while making our societies more democratic in the process? I think this is something we should all think about and be concerned with. So with that, I will say thank you so much for your time. Thank you.